it's actually been a pretty good year for film. Obviously I didn't get to see each one of them, some of them I never got around to watching, and others I decided not to spend what little money I have going to see them. These are the films that could have potentially made the list had I had seen them. If you want to see all the films I saw in 2022 ranked, then there will be a link to the list in the description. I guess we'll get started. At number 20 I have David Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future. At 19 I have Pinocchio, that's Guillermo del Toro's version, not this lifeless piece of absolute. At 18 it's Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. At 17 is Spielberg's The Fablemans. At 16, Cha Cha Real Smooth. 15 is Jordan Peele's Nope. 14 is Barbarian, one of the best casted films all year. Number 13 is Bones and All, a disgusting but at times delightful road trip movie from Luca Guadagnino. At 12, we had some peak Bayhem with Ambulance, and at number 11, probably the most surprising film of the year, Prey. Baz Luhrmann's Elvis is chaotic, energetic, and a highly stylized mess, but it worked for me on basically every level. The insanity in the editing and direction not only makes for an awe-inspiring cinematic viewing, but it also heightens the chaotic and dizzy lifestyle that Elvis led. Saying that, I'm not sure the film needs to be longer than two and a half hours, especially when it's to the max the whole way through. It didn't necessarily feel long or slow, but at times it did feel exhausting to watch, but that wasn't so much a problem on my first viewing. But the thing that really holds this film together and kept me hooked on the screen was Austin Butler's portrayal of Elvis. It's no doubt one of the best performances of the year, and on the completely other side of that is Tom Hanks, who I think just accidentally walked onto the wrong set. A lot of the discourse I've read about Charlotte Wells' After Sun features a lot of lines like it's hard to put into words or something about an indescribable feeling and honestly I'm kind of in the same boat. There are probably a lot of factors that play into this feeling that someone smarter than me can probably analyse but for me I think at least it's the relatability and the realness of the two central characters. I found myself connecting with both a young daughter and a father even though I'm clearly neither of those things. It's the fact that regardless of who you are or what you've done with your life, there's going to be something in this film for you to grasp onto and connect with. And I think that's a credit not only to Charlotte Wells, but also to the central performances from Paul Mescal and Frankie Corio, whose dynamic feels so real and they're so charming that it's hard to believe that they're not actually the characters they're portraying. It's the aspect of the film I keep coming back to because I do feel like the film meanders a bit for the first two acts, but what stopped me from losing interest was the fact that I just loved watching and being with these main characters. Again, similar to After Sun and Elvis, Tar is another film whose central performance is the gateway into the film. Kate Blanchett gives one of the best performances of her career and also in my opinion the best performance of any actor all year. This is of course helped by Todd's Field's direction which really gives her the room to breathe and I think the two of them seem perfectly synchronised throughout the whole film. I think I'll probably enjoy Tar even more the second time around, mainly because I wasn't quite sure what the film was trying to be initially. At the start it kind of tricks you into thinking that this is a film about a pretentious conductor, which I guess it kind of is, but it also has a lot to say about artistry and power, and with each scene Todd Fields just patiently peels off these layers to reveal the underlying darkness, and it makes for a really gripping and thought provoking character study that you just don't get that much anymore. The Northman was one of the most disappointing films in terms of the box office numbers this year, which is a shame because it means Eggers is unlikely to make as mainstream a film as this again. The Northman is by far his most accessible film, but it also contains some of the key pieces that make his filmography so compelling to watch. It's dark and gritty and violent, but I feel like we could have got more. Eggers is definitely not going as weird and as twisted as he possibly could be, but I'd like to think that's probably the studio's doing and not his. I do probably need to rewatch this film because I haven't seen it since it was in cinemas, so I don't have all that much to say, but still, for a historic revenge film, this is probably as good as it gets. Now for most people, Everything Everywhere is probably their number one film of 2022, and if you'd asked me after seeing it for the first time, I would have said, yeah, nothing, nothing is topping this film, but with each new viewing it kind of started slipping down my list. I think that Everything Everywhere and the Daniels really thrive off that overwhelming feeling of having all these crazy concepts and ideas being thrown at your face without really giving you the time to think about the fact you're watching people with hot dog fingers. And throughout most of the runtime, the film kind of balances itself on a line between genius and funny to overbearing and annoying, which became more prominent for me after rewatching the film multiple times. But the thing that 
really pulls the film away from that feeling of overbearing is the cast and the characters, who are just so charismatic and charming. Kihi Kwan and Michelle Yeoh obviously being the highlights of the film, they not only pull off the choreography and the action scenes, but also really nail down the smaller moments. I mean, what the Daniels were able to craft with such limited resources is so impressive. The film manages to feel so big in scale, yet most of it takes place in a laundromat and an office building. But the film really comes together in these emotional moments between the characters, which the Daniels perfectly intercut. They really squeeze out all of the emotion out of you as they build patiently to these big, operatic releases of characters' feelings. The rock scene still being one of the standout scenes of the year, along with the taxes line as well. Just so many great moments throughout the film. The Batman was probably my most anticipated film of the year, not only because I think Matt Reeves is a fantastic filmmaker, but also the fact I'd been desperate for a movie about Batman. We've obviously had plenty of Batman movies over the last 20 years, but none of them have actually been solely focused on the character. I think Robert Pattinson delivers the best performance in the role out of any previous iteration. He looks and feels the part. It's an extremely quiet and subtle performance, but I think it fits the stage of the character perfectly. And in fairness, I think that goes to the whole supporting cast. Colin Farrell and Jeremy Wright won me over immediately. Saying this though, the standout aspect of the Batman in my opinion is Greg Frazier's cinematography. He's easily one of the best around, and his compositions and use of colour are not only stunning to look at, but they also elevate the characters and the story in a way that not many, if any, superhero film has done before, which means he's definitely going to get snubbed at the Oscars. I have more thoughts on the Batman in a video I did a few months back if you're interested. Martin McDonough is one of my favourite filmmakers. I love the way he combines this pitch black comedy with these really tragic and dark characters. I basically love each of his films and The Banshees of Inisherin is no different. I think it slots in nicely behind In Bruges as my second favourite of his. It's not as funny as it is depressing and the way Martin McDonough uses location as a primary tool for tone and atmosphere shines through better than this than in any of his other films. The shots of the Irish landscape are some of the best all year and it's helped by the fact that McDonough really allows the shots to hang for longer than you'd expect which also contributes to the slow pace of the film, which I think suits the cold and tragic feeling he's going for. For me though, again, the best thing about the film is the cast. I feel like I'm just repeating myself here. It's a pretty good year for performances. But I do think this is the best acted film all year, especially Barry Keoghan and Kerry Condon, who I think actually outshine Farrell and Gleason. They also share one of my favourite scenes all year, when Barry Keoghan's character tries his luck with Siobhan, which I think is just a perfect representation of Martin McDonough's filmography. If you've watched some of my other videos, you'll know that Park Chanwick is one of my favourite filmmakers. I love the dark and brutal nature of his films, like Old Boy and Sympathy for Mr Vengeance. So it's surprising to say that Park Chanwick's police procedural is the most romantic film of the year. The first time I saw Decision to Leave, I didn't love it. I actually didn't like it that much at all. It felt like a pretty simple story that had been overly convoluted, seemed cleverer than it actually was. But after seeing it the second time, I was just being silly. Maybe it still is a little bit convoluted for the sake of it, but it didn't bother me as much on the rewatch. What I also got out of it the second time around was all the visual storytelling that I missed trying to keep up with what was happening. Some of the editing and cinematography in this film are insanely good. Park Chanwick has always been extremely stylistic with his choices, but this might be his most stylized and in your face. Every shot felt like something interesting was happening, and it meant that the film was never dull. Even through all the slower and tedious scenes, Park Chanwick delivers information in such innovative ways that I didn't care. The man literally makes a mirror in an interrogation room, one of the most mind blowing things I saw all year. Whenever I make one of these lists, I have to try and remind myself of the feeling of what it was like sitting in the cinema when the credits rolled, and that feeling after Top Gun Maverick was basically a reminder of why I go to the cinema in the first place, and it's clear that that was the feeling Tom Cruise, Joseph Kaczynski, and the whole team behind Top Gun Maverick wanted you to feel, because the dedication to the spectacle here, and to making the most immersive and exciting cinematic experience possible, something that you just don't get all that often and it truly does rub off the screen. When you have a film that has these loud and visceral set pieces with a mix of a human and heartfelt story that not only acknowledges the past but builds upon it, well you're left with one of the greatest blockbusters of the 21st century hands down. I will say though, 
that the problem I have with Top Gun Maverick and basically every other film this year, and it is a big problem, is the fact that there's just not enough blue people. I mean, of course it was going to be James Cameron's Avatar 2. I should have seen this coming about 13 years ago, but here we are. I love the first Avatar. I remember seeing it as a wee boy all the way back in 2009 probably didn't have a grasp of the magnitude of the film, but now in 2022, as a fully formed alpha male, I had the chance to witness the sequel in all its glory, and I'm convinced that this is better than the first. But not only is it better than the first, I think it's one of the greatest cinematic achievements of all time. And not only is it better than the first, and one of the greatest cinematic achievements of all time, it's also my favourite film of the year. By a long shot. A huge shot. It's one of those films where I'm just grateful to have been able to see it on the big screen. James Cameron takes everything which worked in the first, makes it bigger, better, and visually more awe-inspiring. It had me in a state of disbelief and immersion unlike any other film. James Cameron has such a clear understanding of structure and timing. Each scene serves some sort of purpose that isn't necessarily narrative-based, but visually and emotionally based. He trusts the technology and his technical craft so much that the second act of this film essentially serves as an exploration of Pandora's seas, which just made me fall in love with the world and get sucked into it even more. The film all builds to the third act where Cameron just comes into his element and shows off his ability to control and intercut multiple layers of action to an emotional crescendo. The third act is by far one of my favourite parts of any film this year, and it cements itself as one of Cameron's most impressive displays of technicality and creativity. Bring on 3, 4 and 5. And just to finish off a quick 2022 film awards, Best Director, James Cameron, Best Screenplay, The Banshees of Inisherin, Best Editing, Decision to Leave, Best Cinematography, Avatar 2, Best Special Effects, is there any point in saying it? Leading Actor, Colin Farrell, Leading Actress, Kate Blanchett, Supporting Actor, Guy Guam, Supporting Actress, Kerry Condon, and Best Picture, Avatar 2, of course. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you for a great year on YouTube. Your support towards the videos has me forever grateful. I've got some video ideas and some plans for 2023, so yeah, lots to look forward to. Let me know your favourite films of 2022. Mine was Thor, Love and Thunder, but I don't know. Have a good one. Hi, Jim Cameron here. I wanted to thank all of our fans for coming out to see Avatar, The Way of Water, as the Navi say, well, Nati Kamea. I see you. Another. T2. Mm. You better hard on for Cameron. Big one. <laughs>